really excited for our X-Talk today on leveraging technology to help students with challenging course concepts. Our team, I'm Joby Nazarino, I'm part of the Open Learning Residential Education team. Um, but let's get to what we're really here for, which is Mohammed. Um, so um, he's going to talk about tools that help him to identify and explain concepts um, in 801, 802. Um, he is a lecturer in physics and a member of the Physics Residential and Online Learning Lab. Um, and just really excited to have him here. Um, he's also been a past recipient of the Teaching with Digital Technology Award, um, so it, which is an MIT teaching award that is fully student nominated and student judged. Um, so it's really great to be able to hear from you and how you're supporting your students. So thank you again for being here and I'll pass it off to you to right. do your presentation. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, okay, hi everyone, my name is Mohammed. Um, can you hear me well? Because no mics? Okay. Um, all right, so yeah, thank you so much, Jovi, for this opportunity. I'm very glad to be here. Um, and today, as uh, Jovi was saying, I'm gonna speak about how um, I, I am using technology to support students. And I just want to mention that all of the work that I'll be presenting today is a group work from the physics education group, and in particular, the sub-team that is responsible for running the first year courses, A21 and A22. So ev we do everything together. Every person has their own responsibilities, but it is a support of uh, the whole team, especially Peter Dormashkin, of course, and the whole team for A21 and A22 that made all of this technological advancement happen in A21 and A22 recently. So what I want to say is essentially, this is a summary of the talk, it's kind of, how I view myself as an instructor, like what is it that I want to do as an instructor? Like my big teaching philosophy, I think if I want to summarize it in one statement, I would say I want to create a student-centered environment. Like the, the emphasis on student-centered is kind of my perspective on teaching. And this means essentially that I want to meet students where they are, not where we expect them to be or we assume they are. And this is actually not a very trivial task. Like to get to know where students are at is a very fluid task and changes from one semester to another, depending on all the things that they had in high school and the previous years. You don't get like a cohort that is exactly like the previous cohort. And as age goes on, like as an instructor, I don't want to have a gap between where students like what are the way that they are t learning in their, like, their own environment, how they are used to, to learning, and where the current level of them is at. I don't want this gap to widen because we, we stopped being students, but they are the new generation, and things happen all the time, new things. So really what I personally want to do as an instructor always is to try to get very close to our students, like understand where they are at, and the way I do that is through trying to open so many different communication channels throughout the process. So the course, as I'm gonna speak, our 81, 82 course is like a big um, course with many different um, sub parts. And I want to provide communication channels through each part of the course such that I hear, I, I, I as an instructor, I listen to where, what students are saying all the time while they are working on assignments, while they are in class, I wanna see where they are at. And at the same time, create support systems. And that's where technology is helping me to create specific systems to help students throughout the whole procedure. So this is kind of the big picture here, the student-centered picture, so I'll come back to this a lot. But let's give some context for our A21 and A2 blended learning models, so essentially, we have shifted into this uh, model recently where we have a significant part of our course being pre-class. So we have the pre-class assignments called the learning sequences. And this is maybe has been introduced for four years. Before that we had pre-class, but it, it was a little bit different. But the learning sequence is a collection of videos where um, lightboard videos, so uh, Jem here is uh, one of the main people behind the lightboard room here. So uh, students go through this videos and text before every class. So there are a couple of learning sequences before every class. They have to finish those and 
uh, the, there are problems within the learning sequences that they have to finish, and we are grading these problems on correctness just to make sure that they are really engaging with them. Because if they're not graded, we know that many of them will not do the learning sequences. So we want a motive for that. So this is the pre-class part of the course. And then the idea is when they come to class, they have finished this learning sequences, they know the material for the first time, and now it's time to practice on it. So we have the teal setup, which I'm sure most of you or all of you are familiar with here, which is basically focused on group work around the room. So students work together to solve problems. The instructors gives a little bit of review of what they have seen in the learning sequences, but a lot of the time they are working together on groups, and this is the in-class portion. And then after that, they, there is post-class where they work on problem sets, they prepare for the exams, etc. So my idea here is to try to insert within each part of these three some kind of support system that serves two purposes, that helps students like while struggling with these ideas. So it's a help support system for them. But at the same time, it's a communication channel for me or for the instructors to hear where they are at, which should guide the instruction and should guide how we run the course. So that's, that's the main idea of the talk here. So, so I'm going to speak about these particular examples for some technological support system that I created slash I run in the courses. So in the pre-class, I created uh, something called the second chance feature. In the in-class, of course, the whole in-class setup is based on technology. And this is um, um, an improvement made mainly by uh, Dr. Peter Dermashkin and John Belcher like years ago. So it's not my uh, contribution, but I want to say something about the undergrad TA's role in class and how we can use technology a little bit to streamline the process of hiring undergrad TAs. And then post-class interaction with students through different technological pieces through Piazza, through some usage of AI, and through uh, Zoom review sessions. So this is kind of a support system that I'm trying to create for each part of the course. And so let's start with the pre-class component. So as I said, students have these problems that they have to finish before class. And every, that's an example of a problem here. And every problem is graded and has a number of attempts. So usually five attempts for symbolic problems. So students have to get it right within five attempts. And uh, again, we have two, we have like a very large enrollment courses. 82, 82 in the spring has like 720 students. And we have a lot of learning sequences. Before every class, there is two learning sequences. And let me say on average, we have something like um, five to six problems that they have to do before, like within the learning sequences. So before every class, there's five to six problems that they have to get tries for credit. And when we first introduced this uh, learning sequences in that format, we got a lot of feedback from students, especially the struggling students, that they feel very stressed and anxious while working on the learning sequences because they have to get it right. This is the first time they've seen the material ever, especially for students in, uh, with weaker backgrounds. So they feel a lot of pressure that they have to get everything right. And especially when they start running out of attempts, so they're starting to get to their last attempt, they feel very worried and anxious. And I even heard anecdotally from some student that this pushes them to actually cheat or copy the answers from their friends because they are running out of attempt, they want the grades. So, so we thought, I, me and Peter, we thought about, OK, how can we improve the experience a little bit to help reduce the stress a little bit on students while working on the pre-class component, and at the same time, um, give us as an instructor's feedback about, OK, how this component of the course is working. And that's where we, um, I created the second chance feature within the MITx. All of this is in MITx platform. So now in every problem in the learning sequences on MITx, you will find embedded on it at the very bottom this prompt right here, which says, if you finished all your attempts and you didn't get it right, there is a chance for you to get credit. Just click this button. And what we're asking students to do is to reflect on what happened. So what is it that prevented them from getting the right answer? What is the main confusion they had? And 
now how, like, has this confusion resolved? Did they, do they now understand what the right approach would be? And this is happening because students, after they finish their attempts, the, the solution to the problem shows up on MITx. That's the, nor the normal behavior that we always have. So before second chance, they have the option to, v to look at the solution or no, they are frustrated, they lost the points anyway, so we don't know how they engage with the solution, whether like, it's really something that they look at after not getting the right answer or not. So, one, so we're, helping, we're hoping that this, I, I created this two years ago, so it's, like, it's been two years now since we're doing second chances. So we're hoping that this gives them a chance to also do some metacognitive analysis of their thinking while they are learning and engage with the solution that they see in a more critical way. Like, okay, what happened here? Can I identify what is a misconception? That, like what prevented me from getting it right? So in the beginning, stu some students were using it, but the usage of this second chance feature has been increasing a lot. And this semester actually, it's gone like crazy. I don't know like what the particular reason why it's more than last year, but it is a lot more usage. So, okay, one, 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 it happens a lot. But anyway, um, it happens a lot in our uh, 802 slides as well. So, sorry about that, but anyway, so I'm trying to reduce the stress of working through these assignments on their own. I'm trying to get them to reflect on their understanding and at the same time get feedback from them about where they are at, listening to them again, which is the main um, motivation for me as an instructor. I want to see where they are at, what is happening to them. I want to get closer to them. So this is how, to me in a dashboard, I see all their responses. So this is the response, for example, about what went wrong, like what is the issue that you faced, and this is like how you would have done it differently. And so I get like a, a big dashboard of this. At the beginning, when we didn't have a lot of responses, I used to go through them by one, one by one, actually. And like this is available to all instructors. They can look at it if they want. But I used to really read them one by one, but then the usage of it increased a lot. So right now, in this semester, we have almost 2,000 responses uh, so far, while the whole semester, like last year, same, semester, same course, same enrollment almost, we had a total of like 1,800 last year. So right now, we're already nearing 2,000. So there's no way that any human can read through these uh, responses. So I'll let you know, I'll tell you now how like, I make, we make sense of these responses here. But we have an average of 180 responses every week. Um, most of them are approved. So the idea here, when I thought about, OK, the second chance as a way for students to get credit, when they are working on the pre-class, I don't really want to penalize them for like not getting things right. Like I, the way I view the grading here should be more, more or less graded for completion. As long as students are trying their best, they are engaging with the content as much as they can, and they are critically trying to look at their mistakes. So if they do that, we give them credit, the full credit. And uh, so. I don't grade them one by one. Uh, there is a script that I, all of that is like a programming script that I wrote on the side. But within that, the grading of this happens on, okay, there are some filters that the responses have to go through. So I retrieve the attempts that they made in MITx. So I can see exactly the timestamps of what they submitted into MITx. So the script sees that and sees whether they took their time answering the question. It seems like they're doing genuine effort or not. And it seems like the responses, like more or less, are like uh, genuine, not like, because some students will always try to game the system. So I built some built-in filters that kind of red flags responses that look like they are not really doing the work. And then these ones get filtered and I look at them manually. But other than that, they get the credit. And I think, uh, getting more and more responses this semester, I think, proves to me that students see some value in using this. Like when they use it and they, it helps them understand the topic a little bit more or it gives them this um, relaxation while they're working through it, so they use it again and again. This, is, this in itself, I view it as a metric of success. At the same time, I want to use this in order to um, guide my own instruction 
So just looking at the uh, grades of the learning sequences, because if they use this, more or less, they'll get the perfect score. So I would say maybe 10% of the whole class like, don't get the credit and don't choose a second chance. But I don't know how much, like, what is the percentage within those who don't get it right. Like, I'll, I'm going to dig this uh, information anyway, because like, we're doing a research project on this, so I'll, I'll work on that. But I have some statistics about self-reporting from, um, we, we did a mid-semester survey this semester that we just finished the, the results the results of the survey came in. So we almost had everybody responding to the, to the survey because it's, it's graded. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a surprise. So uh, yeah, so it seems like 67% reported that they have used second chance at least once, while there's 31% who use it every week. And this is kind of the percentage of students who they, I would say like these are the most struggling students. I don't. This is all anonymous in a way that I don't see who wrote what, so I, like, I don't use this to identify, okay, this student is struggling because I don't want to break the anonymity, but, but I know that, okay, at least there is some support system for the 30% that use this every, every single week to help them. And of those who use it, 87% uh, reported that this feature helped them understand the actual solution, the actual physics better. And 93 uh, or 94% felt less stressed about the learning sequences while because of the second chance. So these are exactly the reasons why we introduced second chance to begin with. And then one other reason that completes the loop of this whole uh, feedback between us and students, which is again my main goal as an instructor, I don't want to have a gap between where they are and where I'm thinking is, okay, let's take this data and make it available to instructors in a concise way. So what I built this semester, uh, that's the first semester we, we do that, I built uh, a connection between the responses and AI where these responses get sent to be summarized by ChatGPT, basically. So I only send the text, not, no identifying information, just the, the, the text, and we ask, uh, the large language model to give us a concise summary of what the issues that students are facing. And this is generating a slide that is put in the instructor's uh, Dropbox folder where they can, the, the, the place where they have the material for the course. So now before every class, there is already a summary of the main issues that students have had about this particular topic because the class does build on the same material from the learning sequences. So now, instructors have this access for the main issue that th their students have been uh, struggling with in the learning sequences. And different instructors would use this in different ways or not use it, but I know at least some of them will present them, will present the, the issues bef at the beginning of class and maybe at the end of class. And during class, they would focus and pinpoint, okay, let's tackle this issue, let's tackle that issue. And to me, this is a very big part of like, I'm proud of this because it makes, again, for a student-centered environment. We're listening to your issues, we know where you are, and we're trying to address your issues, not what we think is, like, your, is your issues. So that's, um, that's the support from the pre-class part, which builds into in-class. Like, this is a segue for the in-class part because it helps us. Uh, and personally, as an instructor, like, personally, I have read through a lot of these responses myself and the summaries as well, so I, I do try my best to focus the in-class work on these issues that they have. It also, it also gives us feedback about the learning sequences themselves because sometimes the, the problem has some issue that we need to fix. It's not clear enough or something like that, so we need to fix that. Um, also, some of the feedback, even if it's just like like you can see some of the feedback here is kind of okay, there is really something that's confusing in the physics. But sometimes you get feedbacks or many times the responses would be something like I missed, uh, I, d I didn't divide by the resistance or like I missed the dot product or miss I hat, the unit vector, or something like that, which is a very kind of, you can say it's a minor mistake, but this is not, this gives us again fee important feedback that students are where they are at in the mathematical level as well. So the physics level and there's also mathematical level and the summary from AI captures the main repetitive ideas that happen there. So again, it, it feeds a lot into 
the instructor teaching, knowing exactly where students are right now. And these are some quotes from the mid-semester survey. There are tens of similar quotes, so I just picked four. They are more or less all of them are the same. About second chance, they're saying mostly it gives us the opportunity to learn from the mistakes without being penalized and also makes it less stressful. That's exactly the core of the, the, the target that we wanted. And uh, again, there are tens of these quotes. All of them are the same idea. So now we take this into the classroom and like it guides us into thinking about how to run our class and how to, what, what to focus on during class. Uh, but also one integral part of the in-class component is the undergraduate TA. So we have in our model right here where we have 12 tables in the classroom, we want it, we always want to have an undergrad TA responsible for one or two, maximum two tables. They sit with them all the time, they help them during group problems and concept questions. And we view the undergrad TAs, so this would be a group and that would be the undergrad TA, for example, but the, the, they're working on an experiment here, but like they work at the boards a lot and the undergrad TA helps them all the time. We do help them as instructors also and like the grad TA, et cetera, but the undergrad TA has the most close connection to the students. They are students. They have been through this like maybe last year. So we see undergrad TAs as one of the main bridges between the instructor and the students. And we ask instructors to meet with their undergrad TAs briefly once a week to hear from them about if there are any issues in the class, if there are some groups that are malfunctioning or some particular students who are not catching up. So the undergrad TAs are very a very important part of um, our in-class support. And students really view them as like, the support system, the basic support system that they have. So I created like a back system in the back, uh, in the back end, which helps in like maintaining and hiring high quality undergrad TAs, because basically uh, we want a big number of good quality TAs. We have eight sections and like this semester, I finally managed to hire 80 undergrad TAs, meaning an average of 10 per section, and not just any 80. Like in the past, we used to just maybe, we're always short of TAs. We wanted like to have more TAs, which hindered us from really being picky about the quality of the TA. Like we would maybe accept anyone because we wanted TAs. But now I have created this system where it's basically a database of everyone who TA'd in the course before and getting the evaluation so at every semester at the end, we ask the grad TA who's responsible for this section to evaluate the undergrad TAs. And this gets into the database, which we use later for hiring, whether we hire them or not. So for example, this is part of the process that I created for this semester, where I got like a 200 applications from uh, students who want to be either a TA or a grader. So also like, in the past, we had the TAs, the undergrad TAs were also grading the PSETs. And that was, for many of the undergrad TAs, they didn't want to really grade the PSETs because like a huge burden outside of class. So when we noticed that, we wanted to, sw to um, separate them into some people, some people who just come to class, these are the undergrad TAs, just focus on the pedagogy and the interaction with students. Another, another set of um, students who are just graders, they just grade the pieces. And this system helped do this separation. So now, like for example, I received 111 applications for people who want to just grade, 68 for people who want to TA as a first preference and 21 as second preference. And this is all because I'm maintaining this large database so nothing is lost. And all the evaluation from the past is there. So I know exactly who to hire and who to not hire. And for example, I hired um, this semester. So right now we have 72 TAs. We started with 80, but um, some, many of them, some of them will just drop after a week or two because of their course load. So that 10% who dropped from 80 to 72, that's very expected. So, uh, and I have 56 graders, and I manage these 56, the team of 56 undergrad graders to finish the PSETs. So now we have um, like a, a very, 
well-oiled machine for hiring. And I, just, I don't just use it for the big classes. We use it for A211, A23 this semester. In the fall, we use it for A21 and A22. We run both courses at the same time, and A21L. So this database and evaluation um, helps us a lot. And also, the system here like sends out all of this like is just kind of mostly automated. The only thing that's not automated is just me clicking. Uh, okay, let's hire this guy or not. But everything else is automated. Yes, Peter. So yeah, part of this uh, automated system also takes care of assigning uh, TAs to different sections. So for example, here, part of the automation was the emails that get sent out to the TAs. The, they are asked to select the preferences for section times. So, and then like the green things are the, the assigned section to try to optimize the number of TAs in all sections. And I can manually intervene and like change, like, I, like this is a kind of a web page when I, if I click here, it assigns them to web to three, et cetera. So anyway, like this is whole, all in the back end and I think it helped, ha and also this provides a centralized location for, for all the instructors to check who their GAT, under GAT TAs are because in the first two weeks of the semester, we have a lot of fluctuation between sections. The schedule of students change, so they want to switch sections. So it's always a question, okay, who are, my, like every section instructor, who are my undergrad TAs now? Because a lot of fluctuation happens. Now it's all in this link, they can go and see right now, after this switching, these are your undergrad TAs, et cetera. So I think this has made uh, a more reliable procedure for hiring high quality TAs and also graders which are now, um, as I said, I managed a group of 56 graders to finish the PSETs in time. So the PSET is due Wednesday. We get it done every week on Tuesday. So within five to six days. And I think that's also a big improvement because these people are hired specifically to be just graders. So, and I manage them. And because I have built trust through this, like this whole procedure for the cycle of what happens in the course, kind of builds trust between students and me and, and, and other people in the teaching team as well, but I think they, they trust me. So when I manage them, they kind of, they don't want to like disappoint me basically. So they get the pieces done. So, so what I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is improving the quality or the getting closer to students while they are students make them better graders and TAs in the future because they have had a good, good experience and they want to come back and help the course. So it's all like a feedback loop that um, helps the course. So that's part of the support system that I, want, I wanted to create in class. And again, these undergrad TAs give us a lot of feedback about how the students are doing and they are the closest to students. Then finally, a lot of communication channels as well with, that I try to open are happening independent of class, like post-class. So I'll talk a little bit about the use of Piazza. And so we have a Piazza website that I run along with the teaching team with, with very high um, engagement from students. So this is a figure for the number of users who open Piazza for physics every day. And so this is A22 last year, then the summer, A21, IEP, then right now in A22. And you can see on average, we have something like 300 students maybe opening or engaging with Piazza every day. That doesn't mean that they ask questions every day, the 300 people, it just means they open and they look for, like they are confused about something, they're stuck about something, so they open Piazza and they search through it and because the question that they want to ask have probably been asked before already. So wh what I wanted to say from this graph is I think providing high quality and fast responses on Piazza makes students engaged all the time and makes them feel that, again, they are cared about. That's from the student's perspective because if they, like I know in other courses when I speak with students, when they use Piazza in other courses, like they don't necessarily get a response um, or like very, very late response or like not, not very helpful. So the students really appreciate that there is a teaching team here that cares about like listening to their question and answering. It's 
not necessarily answering the question, but more about guiding them into, like giving them a little bit of a help. And um, so that the persistent usage, and you can see there are some spikes around the exam. So for example, this is a spring break here in the last spring. So the drop in the spring break. We had the first exam here, second exam, the final. And here, again, this is the spring break this year. This was exam one. So it's like more uniform this year, but there is a spike coming because we have a second exam uh, next week. So anyway, uh, this is one of the main resources that students rely on in A21 and A22 because they know that there is somebody there who will help them. And it creates a sense of a big sense of community between, again, students and the instructors. And again, it gives me as an instructor a lot of listening. I listen to students, all the concerns, all the issues they have. And the, well, while they're working on the PSAT, on the experiment, while they're preparing for the exams, they're just like bombarding Piazza. Around the exam time, this, it gets crazy. So, so all of this feedback, I view all of this process as me, was the instructors, getting formative feedback from students about this is who we are, this is what we're doing, please help us where we are. And that's, that's my kind of motivation. Uh, you can see here the number of questions um, on Piazza every year in the spring. It's uh, more or less in the same order of magnitude. I think this year we'll reach uh, maybe 1,500 as well. And as you can see, the contributions I do with them personally, like other instructors use it as well, but the contributions I have are always bigger in number than the number of questions because there are always a lot of follow-up questions. So they ask a question, I guide them a little bit, so they ask a follow-up question, so I tell them, did you look at this? Maybe you should do that, maybe. So this kind of engagement is, I don't, I don't see this as a burden or like as an additional thing that I'm doing. I really think about this as an integral part of what makes me a, like a good teacher. It makes me closer to the students. And not just because I want them to, to, like, to lo like me. It's because I want to hear, I want to listen what's happening and like not let that gap increase with time. And I think that's what makes my personal instruction in class and in review session and in, in office hours, it makes it a lot tailored to what students, like they, they feel like, okay, this is kind of exactly what I'm struggling with. This is resonating with me. And it's not just because like, I have some kind of gift. It's more about the effort I put into listening, really. Like, I, I, that's just part of who I am. Then finally, to just finish up this discussion, there is particular support that I give uh, or we try to give before exams. So before exams, basically after going through this whole cycle of okay, there is a pre-class, in-class uh, problem sets, etc., we want to bring closure to this whole. So we have seen a lot of things and we struggled with them together. And together is that important word, like we, we're together trying to figure it out. We bring closure to this whole topics before the exam through two ways. This is the new way where we're creating some, I, I'm creating some AI activities optional that I put in the review problems before exams, where students are asked, okay, we've been dealing with energy and momentum. Can you think a little bit and tell me now from your knowledge, when do we use energy in problems versus when do we use momentum? And let students just like talk, say what they think energy and momentum are used for, just conceptually trying to bring everything in a closed uh, form. And this is sent a lot uh, along with a lot of feedback from me to ChatGPT about how to respond to that, like what are the model answers, what are things to look for in the answer. And basically the AI gives them a very customized feedback based on what they wrote that also has the important key points. So even if they didn't write anything of substance, the AI kind of gives them, I'm instructing the chat GPT to give them feedback that is meaningful, customized, and also uh, has the core principles in it. And then students have a chance to review or rate that response that they got from this experience. Just like a, a trial that we just started last semester uh, because we thought this is one of the places where AI can really help us. Because we cannot really 
take every single student and like have this discussion with them as an instructor. But but we can put our kind of knowledge or expert conversational knowledge, we can put it into a chatbot and like let the chatbot handle students. And on average, students who use this feature, which is like I would say 15% of students use it, it's optional, they rated on average four stars out of five. So I think it's, it's okay. So that's one part to bring closure and again to make them think about the, the create their own big picture of topics. And then finally, I hold review sessions before exams, which again focuses on bringing closure to these topics together. And so these review sessions are run on Zoom and it focuses on two things. Basically, again, it doesn't teach the whole course or doesn't, it just focuses on, okay, we have seen these different topics. Where do they fit together? And when, when you see a problem, how to determine whether you wanna use this approach or that approach. So it just focuses on big ideas and problem solving strategies. And it, like for many reasons, the review sessions I give have resonated with generations of students. Um, like I'm sure if you, the nom nominations for, uh, for the award you've talked about, it's definitely mostly about the review sessions. And that even when I was a grad student in the University of Chicago, I used to hold review sessions and I used to get awards and things like that, which I want to say is not about the, the, the content or the way that I present it at the end. It's more about that I have been listening to their concerns and their particular stance in the course the whole semester. And then now I tailor this review session to exactly pinpoint the issues they had and like directly give them, okay, so you're confused about this. Let's see like how you handle this. Let's see if you're confused about that. So there are a lot of feedback that I get from students about, okay, let's have more review sessions. Let's have them before, not just before exam. Let's just have them earlier in the course. And I tell them no. Like I am only able to help you with the review sessions after carefully listening and like interacting with you the whole the whole procedure and after you have struggled yourself with the whole comp like every component of the course and we have reached together some some like um, level and now it's time to like together put that closure to that level together so I don't I, I believe that this really completes the loop of closure and that's what makes the review sessions good is uh, me continuing to listen every time and just I want to finish by saying um, this whole support system approach that I have to be closer to students' concerns, I, um, I got nominated, I got four awards since coming to MIT. Uh, all of them are student nominated, and um, including the Teaching with Digital Technology Award 2021, which I still get nominated for every year, but we don't want to give it again <laughs> to the same person, which is okay. But um, yeah, so I wanted to say there is uh, a lot of trust that has been built now between students and me over the many generations. And I would say the most important key here is that I try to make it all about students and all about where they are, uh, they are at, not about what I think is the best for them. So thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions. Thank you again for presenting because it was so great to hear about all the, all the way that all these different tools are coming together. More importantly, like how you're talking about um, really listening to students, and I think that's sort of, sort of the core of all of this, right? And my question, I guess, is more along, you know, th there is that need for some productive struggle in all of this, right? So getting all the feedback is great, and in some cases it's going to inform, of course, modification, whatever it may be. In other cases, it may just be that someone is there, or some tool or something is there to help them get through that particular challenge. So what raises to the level of, of for you, like a big red flag for this needs to be in the next iteration of the course versus we expect this to come up and we deal with this individually one-on-one? -on -one? Right, so I would say there are two categories of things that give me red flags about changes. The one thing is if I get a lot of clarifying questions about 
a particular problem in the learning sequences or in the PSET. So students don't really understand the wording, like, or the wording is guiding them into like a wrong place. So that's a red flag that the problem needs to be changed. I'm not talking about something huge, but I'm just talking about a particular problem that is not very nicely worded. Another bigger, um, bigger concern is when we hear from the feedback of students through mid-semester surveys and course evaluations or like any other um, platform, when we hear a consistent feedback that comes like consistently, we try to act upon it. So for example, a consistent feedback that we got from the learning sequences in the earlier years is that I really get, I panic, like, and I don't know uh, like how to solve the problem, and I uh, just, this hinders me from learning. So we, go, we got this feedback a lot, and that's a red flag that something needs to be done about this. But like, if, I get a, if I get some students saying the content is too difficult, like, there are other students who say like, it's okay. Like, as long as there is a major thing that repeats um, in students' evaluation or student feedback, I think that's when we need to act upon. And we don't necessarily just do whatever the students are suggesting. We think about it as a teaching team from the pedagogical. Um, so, so I, I want to say all of the tools I'm, say, I'm, I'm doing here is just supporting the students while struggling. It's not meant to erase the struggle. It, it doesn't erase the struggle. Students still like, when I say struggle, I mean like working hard. That's what I mean. So it's not meant to just replace the hard work. It's just meant to supplement it in a caring way. But students still like ask any students our course. It will tell you, it will tell, they will tell you we're doing a lot of work. We're putting a lot of hours. It's still happening. Piazza questions are about everything. So they're working on a P set. They're working on the experiment. It's not like tied to a particular problem. So they ask about everything on Piazza all the time. But the second chance is tied to a particular problem that they click on. So I, I want this problem. So they submit responses for that particular problem. And that's only for the pre-class, the learning sequences. It doesn't, we don't have second chance for problem sets or things like that. And uh, it resides, this information resides in a database in, uh, in a website that's like my own kind of website that is um, on the site password protected in a database that like only me and people who have this password can view the responses. But it, it, it doesn't reside within MITx itself, the, the responses. It, so it takes the data from a database, which is in, the, in that website, my website, and it processes them and puts them into the Dropbox of instructors. Like instructors have access to a Dropbox. So yeah. Thank you so much. I think before the, the PSET, so that when the PSET is due, but um, could be the weekend too. Could be the weekend. Yes, thanks, Analia. So yeah, I, I, it's it's interesting. You you're meaning that um, goes up and down, up and down. Yeah, I look into it, but yeah, uh, it's an interesting cycle. Right, I don't know why it's more uniform in the, the fall, I have no idea, but uh, the final at least has a big yeah, spike. Right. And I want to add also that there is a little bit of a drop that happened here in the usage of Piazza, and my um, theory here is that this is exactly where we introduce second chance. So before second chance, in the learning sequences, students who are on their last attempt, they will go on Piazza and ask, okay, I'm, I'm on my last attempt, please help me here. So. This happened a lot before, but with the second chance, it doesn't happen anymore. So, so I'm attributing that decrease of usage. It's not like significant, but I think second chance replaced some of the Piazza questions. So the problem sets are different in the sense that they submit a full solution that is graded like step by step. The learning sequences, they just have to put an answer, no matter what the work, they don't have to show work. Well. The argument would be that they have already, like, they have already gotten the instruction that we designed for the course. It's not just like the first time they see it, but still, like, depending on the context, I would still maybe have it, and maybe 
have it maybe not give full credit, but maybe 80% or something like that, depending on the context. But, but for our course, the post class is all about showing your work. So it's a totally different idea. Yes, so I, didn't, I, I, I meant to mention office hours, but I didn't because it, uh, I wanted to focus on the technology side of things. But let me show you quickly something here. So we have a big support system for students with office hours from 20 instructors. And we kind of use some technology here for it, which is this Google Calendar. So it does fit a little bit into technology. So as you can see here, students have this uh, office hours calendar. So they can see every day all the different teaching team office hours. They can go to any office hour. And again, every office hour is different. Like the, the style that you get in the office hour is different. But from my own, and I think for Peter's office hours, we do it in a big room. And like usually a big number of students come just to work on PSETs while we're there. And Again, for me, as I have been in touch with students through different communication channels, within office hours, I have kind of already know the issues that they have been do dealing with in the PSET. And I tailored my office hour, again, to the feedback I already have. But yeah, we have, this is a big part of the support system we give to students as well. All right, well, we're just at time. So thank you again for thank you so presenting much. to us. Thank you. Thank you.